Hello, and welcome to the CFA Society San Francisco podcast, where we interview and discuss current topics with leading members of the Bay Area investment community. This week, Tanya Subatang, Senior Membership Manager with CFA Society San Francisco, sits down with Stan Rudoy, CFA, Vice President of Growth and Analytics at Pollen VC. Listen in as they discuss mobile gaming and venture capital. Hi, Stan. It's a pleasure to have you. How are you today? I'm great. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. Well, I want to get started by saying you've spent a majority of your career in a sector that many little know about, which is the mobile gaming industry. You work majority of your career there, having worked at Revit and now currently VP of Growth and Analytics at Holland VC. I'd really love to learn more about the industry, and I'm sure a lot will, and kind of your insights on what you see in the future. Sure, of course. I'll happy to provide as much as I can. Great. Well, so in order to kind of maybe start, I'd love for you to share the history and the development of the mobile app and gaming sector, and why is it unique as compared to the other gaming or e-commerce? Right, of course. So I would say that the start of the mobile gaming uh, industry, as we know it now, coincides Sided with the introduction of the app stores uh, on our phones, so on iPhones and Android devices. So that was probably around 20, 2012, 2013. That's when it all started. And this sector grew quite a lot, first of all, because of the just the high smart, smartphone ad- adoption rate. So if you think about it, I, th- I believe the uh, smartphone use is still growing if we're looking at the world scale. And I guess another reason why it grew so much is because of the unique business features features that the sector has that other sectors might not have. And I would say that this the main feature is something we call performance marketing. So this feature is enabled by the technology and by social media. So there are two two aspects to it. So the first one is technology, right? So smartphones are something that we, are, we call walled gardens, which allows the developers to track user activity from whenever they clicked on a link. Let's say they clicked on an ad for a mobile game and and then they install this game and then they play this game. You can track that user journey. You can see what they're doing there. You can see the transactions happening. And up to 2021, we were able to track that also across the other apps that user user would have on their phone. So that coupled with the social media data, mostly from Facebook, started off something that we call precision targeting. So if you think about this, around, I would say, 2016, mobile gaming companies, they were able to specifically target the users that are high spenders. So uh, when we look at the user base of any game, it would be top 1% of users that bring in maybe 80% of revenue. And then you have your long tail of users that might not play at all, so that, that might not spend at all, or that might be, you know, spending a dollar or two. And that's not something that's, uh, that may be valuable for a gaming company while it's valuable to, to say that you have a lot of users, but then the spenders are very few that spend sometimes tens of thousands of dollars in the game, if not hundreds. Wow. And I've, I've seen personally tens of thousands of dollars in simple games. <laughs> and I was be, yeah, it was always amazing to see that uh, these people exist. So the performance uh, marketing, it allowed to target those users and it allowed to target those users, let's say they spend a lot of money in other games. And that just led to the ability of, you know, just a couple of young people in their basement starting off a gaming company, which can then have explosive growth that wouldn't be there if this technology uh, wasn't there. So then when we think about the performance marketing, then there is something that we call a user acquisition machine or UA machine. UA is a shorthand for user acquisition. So the formula is very, very simple. It's your lifetime value of, of your user has to exceed uh, your customer acquisition cost. And uh, as a result, what you're looking at is it, it almost becomes an investment formula. So if you think about this, you put a dollar in into your marketing machine, into your UA machine, and then you get a dollar something out in a reasonable time frame. And if you see that this is repeatable, the thing that you need to do is you need to feed that machine as much capital as you can in order to scale. And this this features, you know, the, the technology and the performance marketing, it allowed the mobile gaming sector really grow explosively. And had, we had companies that started from nothing and grow, grew to billions of, well, there, there are a couple of companies, more than a couple of companies,
companies that have billions of dollars of revenue. And yeah, those companies, they initially, they did not require a lot of initial investment. Of course, what happens is that when you scale, your costs will eventually rise. So your user acquisition costs rise. And when they rise, the only thing you, you need to do is to make sure that your game supports those costs and it, in its monetization. And this is where the, you know, the large investments into R&D kick in where you have to really develop something more sophisticated than you had before to just catch up with those costs. But at this basis, it's quite a simple and very, very effective business model. That's why we had this explosive growth uh, over the last 10 years. Wow. I mean, that is very unique. And you kind of talked a little bit about a unique financing. So I'm curious, what kind of unique financing options exist for mobile business? Because it's very different. And how would they choose the appropriate one? Right. So going back to the investment formula, right? So let's say you put a dollar in, you get a dollar sixty out in six months. If you look at this equation and you forget for a second about convexity of the curve, uh, the average return would be 10% per month. So what you need to do is you need to look at the options that you have to fund this machine that where the cost of capital would be well less than 10% per month, mm-hmm. hopefully much less. <laughs> but then you can still go up as you scale until your cost of capital exceed, you know, your revenue that you get from, from your UA machine. And of course, the way that I approach this question when I'm advising any sort of mobile companies is to uh, look at your capital stack, you know, so you go from basically basically from something that costs you nothing, which is Mm -hmm. your cash at the bank. And then you go all the way down to equity, which is usually the most expensive source of capital you can have. So anywhere, something in between could be, you know, your credit lines with your advertising networks, your credit lines with Facebook and Google. And then you can have some quite unique debt products that sit right in between the credit lines and equity. So the reason why they're unique is because, as I already talked for quite a while, the data-driven approach in mobile marketing allows for a precise prediction of your future revenue. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, because still all of the mobile companies, they receive payments, not directly, but through through platforms from Apple, from Google, uh, through advertising networks, there is always a huge payment delay between when the company makes the sale and when it receives the cash. Mm-hmm. So you, when we think about the payment terms, it could be net 30, net 60, net 90. As a result, any mobile gaming company at any given moment has about one to three months of accounts receivable on their books just sitting there. So this actually led to something, to a type of a product that we at Poland VC uh, provide, which is called accounts receivable facility. This is a new product, that, but it is really a twist on a regular account receivable facility that existed for many decades. Um, the reason why it's a twist is because we ingest the data daily. So we basically provide the company an ability to borrow against their receivables on a daily basis. Mm. And this allows them to use that money to put back into the UA machine. The reason why you'd borrow is because you want to put that money back into the UA machine and you want to scale that revenue and then borrow more again and scale again. So a lot of, rather than, you know, it used to be that a AR facility is something sort of like a last resort when you or I guess your inventories, etc. Here, instead, it's a, just a very effective and very flexible way to borrow and to reinvest in, into marketing. That's why the, the whole industry exists is because there is demand for it. In addition to this, there is something that's called revenue-based lending. So this is really a little bit, it's a little bit different, not that much different. I would say that just the form is different. So rather than having a flexible, you know, facility with with an interest rate, it would be a fixed amount loan with an origination fee, but with a flexible repayment schedule. And repayment schedule would be a percentage of your gross monthly revenues. Mm. So you borrow 100, you need to pay back 110, let's say, and you uh, the way you pay it back is by paying 15% of your gross revenues monthly, mm. or up until you pay down your 110. And I would say that how do you approach to the choice is you really have to, first of all, understand your user acquisition machine, how it works, what is your margin, how expensive a capital you can take and start with the cheaper, go with the more expensive. And the second thing, which is extremely important, is to just make sure you understand the fees. Because uh, when we're talking about fixed origination fees, sometimes they may look much cheaper than they are. So let's mm-hmm. say a 7 to 10% origination fee, you might think that it may work out into a decent interest rate. But actually, a lot of these companies, they are targeting a 20 plus annual interest rates. That's just how the business works. And rather than presenting it directly, which would be quite off-putting even in our current higher interest rate environment, it is hidden into a fixed fee. So what you need to do is you need to bring everything to your regular 
you know, annual interest rate mm-hmm. and then compare it to your margin. And this is where you make a choice. Hmm. Wow, that's fascinating. Very different, right? So kind of looking ahead now, it is no surprise in the current environment we have today with social media and privacy laws that obviously affects your industry. What is the latest trend and their effects on the industry? And as I mentioned earlier, regarding Apple's privacy changes and maybe venture capital drying up. Right. So so this is this is quite interesting because we all know about venture capital drying up, you know, in the end of last year and just the difficulty that companies all across any sector they experience right now to raise capital. However, with mobile gaming and the app industry, it's a little bit of a, of a unique situation. So in about April 2021, Apple introduced privacy changes, which basically broke this ability to track the users across different apps on, mm-hmm. on the devices. And while it may be good for the consumer and there is a whole technical discussion whether it's truly good or not truly good, we're not going to get in there. But the reality is that the user acquisition machine margins started to erode already in, uh, you know, in the middle of 2021 and beyond. And what happened is, though, that this privacy changes, they do allow to track the user activity within one when you own the apps. So what happens is that this led to this sort of like an M&A spree coupled with the cheap capital. Larger companies were looking to acquire other mobile games, not even for their intellectual property, but more for their user base to be able to feed the user acquisition machine with the user data that they now legally own. And as a result, they can use that data for for targeting. So this led to a massive consolidation in the industry. We've seen a lot of M&A deals going through at crazy valuations, again, because crazy times, crazy valuations. And uh, what happened is a lot of uh, gaming companies, they were also looking to massively scale to be acquisition ready, right? So when we're talking about acquisitions, we're always looking at a certain size of the company. If a company is too small, it might not be interesting. And the the thing is with the user acquisition machine, you can, if you are really looking at top line metrics, just revenue, you can just dump a lot of money into your marketing and get your revenue up. You will have your, you know, $1 million monthly recurring revenue you quite soon. And at the time, no one really cared about profitability. So what happened is a lot of companies, they did that and some of them got lucky and got acquired. Others ended up in a much more difficult situation because they spent all of their money and they arrived at this point where the venture capital has dried up and it's hard to raise an additional round and they weren't really careful with their with their capital. So what happens now, I would say, looking, looking ahead, right now all across, I mean, the the investments still happen, especially at pre-seed and seed stage. You know, it's not that bad at that stage. However, I would say that investors are much more keen to see bottom line KPIs, right? So rather than just looking at, you know, you have a great IP, you have a great concept, and then you have this, you know, top line metrics, they're looking at profitability already from the very beginning. They're looking to see the proof that you are able to handle your UA machine properly, and you're able to First of all, create it, create the process, if anything, because the technology is already out there to hire the right people to create the process that will allow you to acquire users profitably. And then you need to show that from from the very beginning, you can't just say, oh, you know, I'm going to start with a massive scale up and then I'm going to work on my profitability later on. So this is something I would say that is the most important right now for founders is to just make sure that the uh, concepts that are that you're developing, make sure that the IP you're developing is also monetizable you know it's not it's not just the ip it's not just the scale that matters and because uh, the precision targeting has become much more difficult what i see in the industry is that a lot of companies are actually looking at the ip personalization so rather than target specific users that spend a lot of money uh, what's happening is the the game experience changes based on your behavior so this is a little this is a much more difficult endeavor because you have to invest a lot in r&d to do that uh, but basically what happens is based on the actions that you take in the first days that you play, your game experience changes and adapts to your behavior to extract more value from you, you know, and and this is, uh, yes, I know, and this is a, a little bit 
more difficult than just, you know, working on the UA machine. UA machine still works, especially for the bigger guys. So the bigger guys that acquired a lot of, you know, a lot of user bases, they have millions of users. What they do something we call cross promo. So they cross promote their new titles to their old user bases. They try to develop this portfolio approach. They're looking at the lifetime value of the user, not in a single game, but in a portfolio of games. And that works for them. But for the smaller guys, you really have to work on your intellectual property to make sure it's attractive to avoid the user base and you attract those high value users as well. Well, I'll definitely never look at gaming apps the same way again after talking to you. Thank you so <laughs> much for all that insight and really fascinating how much goes into it, right? Because it is something that's instantaneous on our mobile app and something you can have a ton of different games on your phone. So, right. wow. Thank you so much, Sam, for your insights. It was very exciting to learn and I definitely learned a lot. And it was great to have you today. You're welcome, Tanya. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for listening to this month's episode of the CFA Society San Francisco podcast. We hope you enjoyed the engaging discussion. Please stay tuned for more episodes of this podcast published on the last Tuesday of the month in our newsletter and through the CFA Society San Francisco podcast channel, available through most major podcast apps.